Hi, this is JP Haas. I'm doing a uh, MSK MRI 101 series here. This is going to be for wrist MRI, meant to be a high yield beginner's approach to reading wrist MRI when you come into the bone room. We'll talk about protocols, reading patterns, and a little bit on reporting, but mostly based on the reading pattern. So you'll just have a good strategy about uh, how to get, how to hit the ground running when you come into the bone room uh, when it comes to wrist MRI. This is an outline of what we're going to go through. Uh, we'll do a little bit on MRI risk protocols and uses. I'll do a short little comment on reporting, uh, talking about two different ways of reporting, uh, freehand versus template reporting with the MRI, with the MSK people right now doing uh, predominantly freehand reporting, but template reporting is out there and something that's good to know about. Uh, we're going to use a pattern-based reading approach, which is basically a checklist approach. So when you're reading a wrist MRI, you can just uh, look at it the same way every single time. Look at all the structures you want to evaluate and, and make a comment on that, either in the report or in your own mind. And the goal here will, will again be to be a very high yield basic approach to reading cases. So hopefully you won't be scared to open that wrist MRI when it pops on the list. Uh, what I've tried to do is find normal images, normal cases, so there'll be a scrollable normal-ish study at the end. And then throughout the presentation, when we're going over each of the structures, we'll look at everything with um, with some normal scrollable images. What, what hopefully will happen is that this will be available to you. Uh, so you're listening to this now, you can use this uh, at your own uh, leisure to uh, review it or to scroll on the image yourself and uh, just get used to how things look. These are the uh, protocols, uh, just two basic uh, ones to know for the wrist. The routine wrist protocol and then the wrist arthrogram protocol. Doesn't seem like wrist arthrograms happen too often, but they do happen once in a while. Uh, the workhorse uh, protocol will be that uh, uh, routine wrist without contrast protocol, which is basically three planes, T1 and PD fat sat. Uh, so pretty basic basic protocol, not too hard to remember exactly what Im uh, images you're going to see or what sequences you're going to see. The, the, this will be used for occult fractures, ligamentous or muscular tendinous and injury. It's basically all the routine pathology of the wrist. Other protocols to know that are out there, I don't think this needs any uh, large amount of time to go over. It's just there for reference. Uh, but if you are protocoling or don't want to know what other protocols are out there, those are both on the website and here. Uh, we have a risk for infection protocol, which just uses stir weighted imaging for a nice marrow uh, sensitivity for edema or other abnormality in the bone marrow. And then also adds on those post contrast images uh, that you'll want to have in the evaluation for infection. We have a hand for arthritis protocol, which is uh, pretty similar to the uh, risk for infection protocol. Again, emphasizing some stir weighted images and some post contrast images, which, are, which is helpful in the setting of inflammatory arthritis. And then we have a finger protocol, uh, which is a smaller field of view focusing on that finger that they want that they want to look at, so we can look at the uh, smaller structures of the of the finger. But that's mostly beyond the scope of this uh, of this um, of this module. What what I what the main point of this is to co focus on that routine wrist without contrast protocol, and just to know how to look at the basic structures from that protocol. Template reporting is something that's definitely out there. There's been a movement in some parts of radiology to um, do most things in template reporting or more things in template reporting, but that ultimately I think comes down to your practice and your preference. Um, this is a uh, template report from RSNA RAD Report, which is a good website to look for uh, templates for all kinds of different uh, modalities and different parts of radiology. Uh, like I said, MSK staff at this time, almost all of us, I think all of us use uh, free dictation. Uh, we did come up with um, some PowerScribe templates for MSK MRI shells, uh, and then th those can be found under the PowerPoint um, templates in Dr. Peters, but we did not have one of those for every um, single joint, at least at this point. Maybe we'll address that in the future. This is how I lay out most of the time the wrist MRI in packs. It's six sequences that you want to hang. There is definitely no right way to do this, but I would advise you to just sit down with your first case or whatever case you want and to uh, just think about what the easiest way or what makes sense and most sense in your mind to hang it that way and then just to be consistent about it. Hang it the same way every single time. Uh, so I put these six sequences up typically on a uh, four by four uh, screen. So the uh, 
left side of the screen will have this and then my second monitor will have this. All right, this is the reading pattern. Um, so uh, it goes down, it starts with tendons, uh, then goes into ligaments. So it's sort of an outside in approach. And then finally at the ends, bones, cartilage, soft tissues. So we'll just take one one by one and, and go through all, all the anatomy, uh, hopefully with pretty good scrollable images. I did try to find a pretty normal study. It was a little harder than I thought. I'm always on the lookout for good uh, normal studies on, on young people. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll do the best we can with what we have uh, based on the images we're given. So this is the systematic approach. Um, it doesn't matter how you do it, but uh, again, I would just recommend being consistent about how you do it. And once again, I start, start from the outside and kind of go in. So I'll start at the front of the wrist and do the flexor tendons and carpal tunnel structures. Then I'll go to the back of the wrist and do the extensor tendons. Uh, then I'll uh, usually go that first to the TFCC and then the intrinsic ligament. So the extensor tendon is one of those that you look at as the extensor carpi ulnaris, which is part of the, the subsheath as part of the uh, triangle fibrocartilage complex. So I'll do the TFCC since I'm already looking there. Then we'll just shoot over right up to those intrinsic ligaments, two main ligaments to look at, scaphalunate, luna, joiquitra ligament. Then we'll do the extrinsic ligaments of the wrist, uh, and then the bones, the cartilage, and the soft tissues. So here's the carpal tunnel and flexor tendons. This is an axial image, T1 weighted image of the wrist. Um, we want to evaluate all the superficial and deep flexor tendons in the carpal tunnel, looking for the routine things that we usually look at on MSK MRI, tendinosis, partial tears, full thickness tears, tenosynovitis of those tendons. <clears throat> it's pretty easy to follow the uh, flexor carpi radialis and the flexor carpi ulnaris muscles to their attachments. So um, you can do that. And then basically looking at this carpal tunnel structures, uh, which is covered up by the flexor retinaculum. Uh, we have a deep and flexor, a uh, deep and superficial tendon for all these tendons, and then we have the median nerve. But we'll go over that uh, again here in a second. And uh, as you'll see down here in the bottom right for all these, I'll have the um, part of that template or of that reading pattern in there. So just so you can have that for reference, if you you know want to know what we're looking for on this part of the reading pattern, you guess you can just go down and look at the flexor tendons. We're going to look at the superficial and deep flexor tendons, the FCR and the FCU. Okay, so this is a scrollable uh, series. So um, I, it, because I'm recording, I don't think I'll be able to go back and forth, which is always nice to do when you wanna go and look over things. So we'll just have to do the best we can in finding these things the first time through. Um, so uh, we can tell here already that this is gonna be the radial side of the wrist because that looks more like the radius. This will be the ulnar side of the wrist because that looks like more like the ulna. So we'll be focusing on these flexor um, tendons as they come in. Uh, so this, this should be the flexor carpi radialis. This should be the flexor carpi ulnaris. And then hopefully these are all those superficial and deep flexor tendons. So we'll just start scrolling as we come down. And yes, that's what these are. Um, so you can see here all these deep flexor tendons, these superficial flexor tendons covered up by the uh, flexor retinaculum, which is a nice thin structure and uh, also the median nerve, which I'm kind of just outlining with small dots here. So those are the main things you want to try to look at on the wrist MRI. Axial is really workhorse sequence, most of what you need for this. Um, and after the axial, uh, I have up here the T1, but you'll also be evaluating these on the fluid sensitive as well, looking for abnormalities of those structures. All right, following that all the way through. And that's actually into the carpal tunnel beyond that hook of the handmaid and into as you get into the uh, hand and then it starts to separate again as it as attendants uh, spray out into their uh, various fingers that they go to. So uh, we want to evaluate the, the primary structures again is the median nerve in the, in the carpal tunnel. Uh, carpal tunnel MRI findings are not uh, often used, but you know if you are going to find an abnormality, it's good to know what they are. So that would be palmar bowing or too much anterior bowing of this retinaculum, or, or if it's too thick. Um, the median nerve can look abnormal. Uh, I won't say this is a common finding, but you know you can evaluate that. And if you think the nerve is either uh, distorted or flattened or, or thick or too big or too bright on the T2 weighted signal or enhancing, I suppose, if you have post contrast images, those would all be findings that could be seen in the setting of carpal uh, tunnel syndrome. Uh, Guillain's canal is uh, where the ulnar nerve and, and vessels sit just adjacent to the ulnar side of the carpal tunnel. Um, I don't know if we'll have another shot to scroll through that, but you can scroll through that and pretty easily see um, the ulnar nerve typically um, as that stippled structure with the nerve fascicles adjacent to the carpal tunnel. 
And again, all this anatomy is well seen on the axial images. Okay, so here we come again. Okay, I guess we hopefully will scroll here. Okay, so now we're gonna be looking at the carpal tunnel and flexor tendons. Uh, just reviewing all this anatomy again. Once again, FCR, FCU, and the carpal tunnel. Here's the median nerve, which you can kind of make out on the, um, on the uh, fluid sensitive sequences. And here's the ulnar neurovascular bundle there. A little bit harder to see, but I think this is some of that ulnar nerve right here. And those are the, that's the anatomy we're looking for. Can't go backwards, unfortunately. But that's a pretty normal look. The extensor tendons, then we'll go to the back of the wrist. So there's anatomy that you just kind of have to learn here. Um, I thought it was pretty intimidating at first, but as it turns out, there's actually a pattern that makes it, uh, I thought, at least for me, it made it pretty easy right away to, to, to remember these. And that's just that you have six extensor compartments. And as you go start at the radial aspect of the wrist and go to the ulnar side of the wrist, uh, it goes longest brevis, longest brevis, longest brevis. So um, with that in mind, we can, we can just start at the radial side of the wrist and say, okay, since it goes longest brevis, longest brevis, just try to remember abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor pollicis longus. And that's where the pattern kind of stuff then breaks apart. But um, the extensor digitorum is uh, extensor compartment four, which has multiple tendons. The extensor compartment five is extensor digitorum minimi. So four and five, you just kind of have to remember, oh yeah, those are all the finger tendons uh, and the, and the, and the uh, extensor tendon of the fifth finger. And then this last one is extensor carpi ulnaris, which I think tends to be a little bit easier to remember just because it's the one that's often abnormal if there's only one that's going to be abnormal. So yeah, like I said, that that takes a little bit of a little bit of a self study just to get those down. But uh, if you want to just be able to read the wrist MRI well, just go through those tendons, and then you'll be able to to follow them and look for abnormalities like thickening partial tear, tenosynovitis, full thickness tear of those tendons. Uh, the first compartment, tenosynovitis, is your uh, is where you get the queer veins tenosynovitis. Uh, and the sixth compartment um, is that extensor carpi ulnaris, which once again often has tendinosis or subluxation. The uh, extent ECU lies in this ulnar groove, which on this picture that we have here is not that well formed, but it's usually a nice well formed groove that's uh, covered by the subsheath. And uh, it, this is that's a structure that can be uh, abnormal or or lax, and then the the EC uh, the extensor carpi ulnaris will tend to uh, will tend to migrate. Uh, towards the ulnar side of the wrist and come out. There's uh, some intersection sy syndromes to know uh, that the first and second uh, compartments cross over about four centimeters proximal to lister tubercle. So that's in the distal forearm, the first and second uh, crossover. And then the one you'll typically more often see on the wrist MRI would be um, the second and third extensor compartment crossover. So we'll follow this on the images as well, but this is two and three. And what happens is this is pretty proximal, but this, this third extensor tendon compartment will cross over the second extensor tendon compartment. And a crossover syndrome is where you get pathology related to that crossover, uh, typically manifests as tenosynovitis of both of those tendons. So you'll see fluid focally around those tendons in the vicinity of the crossover. Okay, so here we're gonna go through the extensor compartments. Uh, running through the real-time images, the scrollable images, uh, starting on the radial side and going to the ulnar side. So the first through th sixth extensor compartments. Uh, I will say that on this case, that the extensor pollicis longus is just a little bit harder to see than typical. So, uh, but given that, we'll just kind of go through here. So we're starting proximally and going distally. Um, so uh, the landmark that you can look for is Lister's tubercle, which I've already almost missed, but it's right here. Um, this little pointy structure right here, uh, which is which separates out um, the first and or excuse me the second and third extensor compartments. Um, so you can always find that as as your landmark. So somewhere over here is going to be starting with longus, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, and extensor pollicis longus. So as we follow this out, we're going to expect this third extensor compartment to cross over the second extensor compartment. And then over here, we'll have our fourth, our fifth, and our sixth extensor compartment. Extensor digiti minimi. Um, extensor, uh, excuse me, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti mini me right here, and then extensor carpi ulnaris right here. So let's follow these out 
And you'll see how this uh, third extensor compartment is starting to cross over right there. And it's kind of uh, comes as intermediate signal and then comes back right here to the extensor pollicis longus uh, as it goes to the uh, extensor thumb. And we're gonna, and then you follow this out all the way. So all these tendons can be followed in, uh, back and forth. You can do that as, uh, as you, um, as you want to go through them on your own. Uh, but those are, that's the basic anatomy that you want to get down for the extensor compartments of the wrist. There's intersection syndromes uh, where, like we already said, that those cross over at those points. So you can look for fluid or tenosynovitis in those tendons. Okay, um, then we can go to the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist. The two, there's two important ones to evaluate, the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral ligaments. There's small ligaments between all the carpal bones, the radiocarpal bones, um, but those are the two that you need to know about. They're both U-shaped ligaments having um, a dorsal, a membranous, and a volar portion. And the dorsal components of those, both of those ligaments are the strongest components that uh, you want to look at most closely because they are the most important stabilizers of the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist. Uh, but we evaluate all three of these components and just comment on them. So when you're looking at the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist, try to, uh, on both the coronal and axial images, uh, try to visualize those things, those each portion of those ligaments as best you can. Uh, so here's some MRI uh, static images showing those. The, those bones in the proximal wrist, uh, scaphoid, uh, lunate, triquetrum on the coronals, and then uh, also with some notations of how those ligaments look on the uh, axial images. Usually on the coronal images, there's some nice little black triangles that you could find, especially on better uh, quality studies or and 3T um, magnet studies, which is which are the best uh, which is the best technique for looking at those structures. Uh, there's, uh, these are important stabilizers, like I've already said. So, um, the scaphalunate tears, try to remember that those are the ones that give you your dissy def uh, deformity. They, if, if the scaphalunate ligament is torn, it will tend to let that lunate dorsally rotate. Um, so you'll have a widened scaphalunate angle and that's dorsal intercalated segment instability. If you have a disruption of the lunotracheal ligament, that would le lead, be more likely to lead to a vissy deformity, volar intercalated segment instability. So let's try to scroll on here. Uh, looks like we have coronal first, probably going volar to dorsal. We see those uh, flexor tendons coming across. And what we're gonna be looking for is when we can start finding the scaphoid lunate triquetrum, which I think that's gonna be it, yep. And we'll start to look at these ligaments. So we already kind of came across the volar component, but here's the scapholunate ligament right here, that black uh, structure right there and the lunotriquetral ligament right there. Now, this is not textbook quality anatomy. Um, maybe at some point I can get a little better better, uh, better study, but uh, this is also, I think, still appropriate because this is often what you have. You know, you kind of, we work in the real world and we don't always have textbook quality images of everything. Uh, and this is often how those ligaments look. So, um, you know, clinical history helps if there's trauma or not trauma, but um, sometimes this is how these ligaments look. Um, and especially the scaphalunate ligament, you know, we can kind of make out how that triangle looks of the membranous component. Um, so that looks more intact. And on a couple of these images, you'll see, you know, it looks a little more normal than it, uh, other, other images, it looks a little more intermediate. So you basically just have to come up with your own assessment if you think those ligaments are intact. Now, I don't, I think this was, uh, I, I don't, I don't remember the indication for this case, but you know, there was no concern for intrinsic ligament pathology and this was all uh, in keeping with uh, normal wrist intrinsic ligaments. So we're starting to reflect off to those dorsal components of the of the ligaments there. So as you come off to the dorsal components of the bones and you know maybe you just wanted more two more slices here, the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament here and the dorsal part of the lunotriquetral ligament there. And I'm just kind of notating just adjacent to it. And then we come out of it and we're out. All right, let's see what we else we have here since there's another place here. Yes, the axial images. So again, we're going from the forearm into the wrist. This is the radial side. This is the ulnar side. So the scaphoid is going to pop up on that radial side first. And hopefully we can see that scaphoid here and the lunate here. And we're just going to have to try to visualize the best we can. Now we can't cross reference like we can in PACS because that's super helpful. But somewhere right here is that volar scaphalunate ligament. Somewhere back here is that dorsal scaphalunate ligament, and that's uh, how that they come to focus a little bit better here. Dorsal scaphalunate ligament, volar scaphalunate ligament. 
as they come through. Now, the same thing you can do here, which we've already kind of missed, but uh, at the Luna Tricretral ligament, you'll be looking at the same thing in those. So, uh, you know, that's not easy to do on one run through, but that's uh, the, the Luna Tricretral, uh, excuse me, the scaphalunate Luna Tricretral ligaments on one run. And it'd be good to kind of go back and forth and get that anatomy again and again. Um, you know, and then once you get far enough in the axials where you see, for example, the hook of the handmade bone, you know you're out of your uh, proximal carpal row and into your distal carpal row, so you've already gone too far. So uh, that's about the best I can do it just on, on one run through, especially that lunatroquitral ligament. I didn't think we saw that well, but we'll keep uh, doing the best we can. And follow that all the way through. Okay, so here's a schematic where you just look at all the parts of the TFCC. Um, with the TFCC means triangle cartilage conference co co complex. Um, it has five parts. Um, I think it's good to know what all those parts are. So if you know, it's probably a good board type question too, but uh, what are the parts of the TFCC is, is uh, something that you're gonna need to know if you read wrist MRI uh, and you can split that out into the TFC proper. So the TFC proper, I, I evaluate each one uh, starting on the coronal images. So it has a radial, attach, uh, a radial attachment right at that radial side, a disc, um, which is sort of just a more linear structure just adjacent to that. And then it has the peripheral foveal and styloid attachment. So you can just think of the um, ulnar the, as the ulna have, as having this kind of fovea where this kind of indentation where there's part of the TFCC inserting and then the styloid attachment where this part inserts. Um, and we'll see how that looks on MRI images, but those peripheral foveal and styloid attachments are a little, often a little bit more intermediate signal or heterogeneous as a normal variant uh, than the, than the uh, radial attachment or the disc. Now, as you come off the scaphalunate ligament proper, um, excuse me, the uh, TFC proper, um, you have kind of a, a volar and a dorsal thickening of the, of the uh, complex, which is what basically what is the radial ulnar ligament. So you have a volar and a dorsal radial ulnar ligament that you can just think of as kind of thickened peripheral portions of uh, at the anterior and posterior parts of, that, of the triangle fibrocartilage. And I try to evaluate those on um, usually the... Uh, sagittal images and sometimes the coronal images the best i can looking uh looking at the integrity of those the ulnar copper ligaments especially the vulnar the vulnar ulnar copper ligaments are uh, designated structures of the tfcc um so you, uh, if you're looking on sagittal images coming right off this tfc area you can look uh, for you know ligaments that come up especially to the ulno triquetral ligament or the ut ligament um, which I think has been studied in the past. I don't, you know, I don't think clinically we commented it often that much in routine wrist MRI, but uh, that is the structure of the TFCC. And then the ECU subsheath. So we talked about those extrinsic, uh, excuse me, of the eccentric compartments of the wrist with the sixth eccentric compartment being ECU, which is covered by a subsheath, which comes around to this area of the wrist and is a part of this, uh, of the triangle fiber cartilage complex. And then finally, the meniscus homolog, which is a triangular structure that you can uh, often make out on this, um, kind of this area here, uh, adjacent to the uh, other structures of the TFCC. So we look at all these structures, but we especially evaluate the TFC proper, because I think most of the time when we call TFC tear or TFC abnormality, we're looking at, the, at that TFC itself, especially the radial attachment, the discs, and sometimes the foveal and stylate attachments. And all three planes can be helpful in this evaluation. Okay, so let's try to scroll on this the best we can. It looks like I'm gonna have a few different uh, sequences and different planes. Um, that will be kind of hard to correlate, but we'll do the best we can. So starting with the coronal, again, coming front to back. So we're gonna look for, for when we start getting to the radius on this uh, image, on these uh, fluid sensitive images. So I think that's gonna be our first radius. So this might be starting to get to the TFC right here, but hopefully we'll get some better slices. So yes, yeah. so now we're coming into the radius and you can see the first parts of this um, radial attachment of the TFC there. So that's that radial attachment. This is the disc. I'm gonna put it just just distal, just uh, caudal to it so you don't have to have the anatomy actually gone. And then this is the other parts of the TFCC here that'll come into those foveal and stylate attachments, uh, just outlining this structure. And we're already kind of coming out of it, but and I covered it up a little bit as it turns out in the sequence, but this is the radial attachment, the disc, and then the foveal and stylate attachments. And that's that's the structures you're looking for. And as I kind of said before, these look, notice how these foveal and stylate attachments are just a little bit more intermediate 
that's okay. Uh, especially in the setting, if they're not thinking of TFC injury, if you just have a little bit of intermediate signal in those structures, it tends to be fine. Um, now, the other things that are kind of where you're supposed to be able to look for would be the um, ulnotrich, or excuse me, the meniscal homolog up here. And then, uh, as I told you before, those uh, radio ulnar ligaments, which um, we kind of already went through the volar radio ulnar ligament because we started with the volar wrist. But as we come through this TFCC, and maybe even starting on this slice right here, you know, as you come to that dorsal little bit more thickened portion, you know, that's going to be the, the radio ulnar ligament. So that's one run through those. Okay. Um, so we have next is the, um, next we have the axial, which can be helpful. Um, usually there's one or two slices where you can see most of this stuff. So we're kind of getting into the distal ulna here. The ECU is right here. So the subject of that is going to be, which you can start to see is a real thin black structure uh, on that image, right? Just adjacent to that line. So we're going to follow that around. Now we're coming to the ulnar styloid tip. So we're going to know we're coming off right into that TFCC. So this is, you know, this vague bi uh, black uh, tissue uh, TFCC stuff here, which is a little bit difficult to see is going to be uh, what this looks like on the um, on the axial images, and it's uh, not easy to see on this one se single sequence. Again, requires a lot of um, a lot of uh, triangulation and looking at everything. And maybe maybe some of this is the um, some of this uh, volarly and dorsally. Maybe is uh, just part of that volar and dorsal um, radial ulnar ligament. Okay, we're ready to kind of come out of it by that point. So um, so that's the axial images of the things you want to try to look at. Uh, through the TFCC area, and then finally the sagittal. And this is the one where I think I usually try to get some better sense of the, dors uh, the dorsal and volar uh, radial ulnar ligaments. As we come through here, this is part of the TFC here. And these are not stuff that is often well made out, but you know, at the, at the anterior side, uh, you have the uh, volar radial ulnar ligament. At the dorsal side, you have the dorsal radial ulnar ligament, and you just kind of have to do the best you can, and you follow those through. Um, as they come across that TFCC area, and then eventually you're, pro you're probably coming into the distal radius here. So we know that that'll be kind of those that volar attachment of the of the radial ulnar ligament and the dorsal somewhere back here, um, and you're getting out of it. And now you're probably getting into the radius. This is the lunate bone here, and you're coming across to the other side on the radius. So I didn't even show you the ulno, uh, ulno triquetral or ulno carpal ligaments on that. Uh, but like I said, it's not usually a comment. We, we, um, it's not usually a structure we comment on very much in the routine wrist MRIs. Uh, but I think it's, you know, just, just to know the anatomy and try to look for it is fine. Um, and probably the best shot at that ulno triquetral ligament or ulno carpal ligaments will be on that sagittal uh, sequence going from the TFCC itself, just uh, shooting up to that triquetral bone. And you can just make sure you're on the right bone by cross-referencing with the um, coronal. So that's one run through the TFCC. Okay, uh, here's some examples of TFCC tear. Um, at the top, we have a, a coronal a fluid sensitive image with showing a, a foveal and styloid tear. So again, this is more than more than uh, what we'd expect for that normal variant. It's a regular, it's, it's got increased signal, it's got a uh, partially fluid signal at the foveal and styloid attachments compatible with tear. But again, like I said, that, that diagnosis can be tricky. You often have to be, I think, pretty descriptive just to say, oh, I think this is a tear because I see this finding. Uh, here's a, on the bottom uh, left, a wrist arthrogram. So this is a tear of the disc of the TFCC. So you'll notice right adjacent to here at the at the uh, radial attachment, there is some tissue attaching there at that, at that, at that uh, radial attachment of the TFCC. But just adjacent to that in that disc, it's a little irregular. And it's got a, a tiny perforation. And we know it's a perforation because this is an arthrogram where we inject joint into the wrist joint space and we see contrast on this T1-weighted sequence extending into the distal radial ulnar joint. So if you have um, fluid uh, communicating between those two, you basically know that there's a TFCC tear because that's where that tear should be. Um, if this, if this uh, contrast would have gone into the mid-carpal compartment, that implies uh, a tear of the scapholunate ligament or the lunotriquetral ligament because those are the structures that uh, keep uh, those two compartments from communicating and uh, would a tear with those would lead to fluid in the mid-carpal compartment. A couple examples of tear. The TFCC, um, again, just another slide here saying that, you know, we mostly look at that TFC proper, but, but think about the other compartments as well. Um, 
this is a, on the top left, just a scheme of, again, how that, you know, if you're right at the level of that ulnar styloid tip, you know, you should be at that, at the area of those radio ulnar ligaments. So that's kind of how, what, what kind of you're trying to picture in your mind um, on a schematic here and then here on a real image uh, showing the dorsal and volar radio ulnar ligaments adjacent to this area of the ulnar styloid tip. Um, here's the uh, schematic of those uh, ulnar carpal ligaments, especially the ulnar tricuteral ligament. So you see here how they just, they come right up off the TFC and they just go up and attach at those bones. Um, and, you know, you kind of have to get lucky, I think, a lot of the time to see these. But, you know, here's an example at the bottom right here of a pretty well seen ulnar tricuteral ligament on a coronal image. And I think they're try here trying to show an ulnar lunate ligament. So, um, you know, just, just, just try to know that they're there. That would be the best I could say. Okay, so TFCC tears have uh, classifications called the Palmer classifications, and it's I don't think it's super important to uh, know. I think this can just be used as, as reference, uh, but, uh, you know, they, it, it can be helpful just because you know if you're breaking down the anatomy and just calling your tears based on these specific things, um, it, it's going to help the surgeons know uh, you know, where the tear is and those and where that tear is can help them dictate um, what type of uh, what type of treatment the patient will get. So, you know, I'll just kind of briefly go through the traumatic TFCC classification here, where 1A is a tear of the disc. So we talked, we saw a tear of the disc. 1B will be a tear um, of the peripheral attachments uh, near that uh, foveal or stylet attachment. 1C is the uh, volar radial ulnar ligament. And 1D is a tear right at that distal radius attachment. So um, I don't think we dictate almost always, you know, type 1D Palmer tear from post-traumatic tear TFCC, but um, you describe these and it does help them. Uh, and then here's a contiguous uh, just drawing of what happens in degenerative TFCC tears, which maybe are even probably more common than post-traumatic tears. Um, but um, uh, so from A, B, C, D, E, um, I think they're here showing uh, towards the beginning images just a slight fraying of the um, of the TFC proper, and then you end up having cartilage abnormalities um, on both sides of that ulno lunate joint. Once you get to B, and then finally you get to uh, perforation of the uh, TFC uh, disc at C, uh, and then you get higher grade chondromalacia in uh, D. And uh, finally, you get bigger tears in E. Uh, the other thing that is happening between C and D is that we have an intact lunotriquetral ligament here. And then in D, the lunotriquetral ligament is gone. That's said briefly here. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate. I, I wouldn't um, get too burdened down by this. I don't want you to try to remember it or anything. But, you know, just, just to know the continuum. Oh, yeah, the TFC becomes frayed. Then you start to get chondrosis or cartilage abnormalities, the TFC then tears, the lunotriquetral ligament then, then tears, and then you get bad arthritis. That's the general progression. Okay, and extrinsic ligaments of the wrist. So there's this is really dense anatomy um, that I don't think it's super worth knowing in, in great, great detail because um, it doesn't get, it doesn't get, um, it doesn't tend to be that important um, unless you actually find a, a, a sprain or a tear of that specific structure, then you probably can look it up. But uh, the extrinsic ligaments basically comprise a portion of the wrist capsule. Um, <clears throat> but try to focus on a few key ligaments that I think are good to know. And I think I heard this at RSNA one year. Uh, it made sense in my mind. I, I kind of liked it. So that's kind of how I visualize it. Uh, the, volar rainbow, the volar rainbow and the dorsal Z. So uh, there's all these ligaments that basically you can just... Um, look up if you want, like, you know, just for example, this volar rainbow, and obviously they're not different colors in real life, but they can just be thought of just kind of arching over as, um, you know, a, in kind of a rainbow pattern, um, which at least in this picture, you can see, you know, you have your radial collateral ligament. We don't usually look at that on MRI at all, but you have uh, the two the two that tend to be at least looked at a little bit more on the volar side would be the radio scaphal capitate ligament, um, the, long radio lo uh, the long radio lunate ligament, and your radio uh, luno, your short radio lunate ligament, and then your uh, volar radio ulnar ligament. Now, notice this volar radio ulnar ligament. That's the exact same ligament we were talking about for as that volar part of the uh, TFCC. 
Now this is a little different than maybe the one that I tend to um, tr tend to tend to try to remember, but I I tried to put these these uh, you know abbreviations in my in my mind as two of the more important volar ligaments, the radial scaphoid capitate ligament and the radio lunate trochoidal ligament. So those are a little bit different locations, as you might think. You know, the scaphoid to capitate is kind of I'm going to do a little, another t color. Just this is really going to be hopefully uh, it's not going to be that easy, but the radio scaphoid capitate ligament is shown here. Um, and you can see how that's a little bit uh, uh, more along this orientation. And then the radio luna triquetral ligament is more along this orientation. And I think their other word for that here is the long radio lunate ligament, which is fine. Uh, but you know, the, the, the ligaments just naming the bones for which they attach in my mind makes, makes a lot of sense. So um, the two main volar ligaments, which are the more important vol uh, uh, external ligaments that, that, that more so than the dorsal are the uh, the radio capitate and radio lunar So that's why I at least made those into the uh, reading pattern. And um, the dorsal Z, um, you can kind of think of as uh, a Z like Zorro uh, that come across here. It's boom, boom, boom. Um, and the dorsal intercarpal ligament is that distal part which um, just goes across the dorsal portion of the wrist. And then there's a, uh, a dorsal that kind of courses obliquely here, the dorsal radio triquetral ligament. And then the dorsal radio ulnar ligament is that last part of the, of the Z down here, which again, just like the other part, is the same thing as that dorsal component of the um, TFCC. So volar rainbow, dorsal Z, but just emphasizing a couple, a couple um, more important structures to know. Okay, so that was a busy slide. Yep, yeah, just if I would just break it down and simplify, I'd say the volar, the wrist has volar and extrinsic ligaments, extrinsic wrist ligaments. There are many, but a few are more uh, more emphasized as stabilizers. Generally, the volar ones are more important. And if they look abnormal, they can raise question of sprain or degeneration depending on the history. So if it's a history of trauma, and I see, oh yeah, the dorsal intercarpal ligament is kind of thick and edematous, got edema around it. Easy, call that a wrist sprain. That's uh, kind of one of the abnormalities for your case. All right, so let's see if we can see these very well. Um, I'm gonna guess to start on the volar side since that's more important, but you know, here's our radius, here's our ulna. We've looked at all these other structures, these tendons on the outside. So we're gonna be trying to find the best we can um, these ligaments on the dorsal and volar side of the wrist. So this is not easy to see, but you know, there's ligaments here that are gonna start to come that just make these uh, volar and, and dorsal wrist capsule. Now here's on the dorsal side, I'll take that off just so I can uh, try to show you. On the dorsal side, this is probably part of that dorsal uh, dorsal radiocarpal ligament. And this is hard to see on the axial anatomy and only one run through, but that's kind of what you're looking for. See this part here? It's all this intermediate stuff deep to the, deep to the um, carpal tunnel. I mean, those are gonna be somewhere in there is gonna be your uh, extrinsic wrist ligaments on that volar side. So that's how they look on the axial one run through. And then let's go on the coronal, again, coming front to back. Sometimes you can kind of vaguely see the ligamentous look, kind of that strided look on the um, ligaments. So we're still at the uh, volar flexor tendon here. So let's see if we get any look at that at all. And I've already kind of put dots here, but if, after we come out of that, you know, this is kind of some vaguely, vaguely linear stuff. Again, just know that there's a radio scaphocapitoid kind of going more like this way and the radio luno triquetral kind of going more this way, but that's probably the best you're going to get on uh, many cases. And we already kind of went over this portion over here where we have the, um, where we have the radio ulnar ligaments. So, and then as you come through the uh, volar to the dorsal side, you see this uh, dark, dark uh, ligaments here. Um, you know, this is going to be those extrinsic wrist ligaments. So uh, we know, you know, there's a something like that. Our dorsal Z was trying to do something like that. Okay. Um, so since it's so hard to see on the anatomy, you have to get kind of textbook pictures or just try to find it the best you can. But here's two of those main ligaments that I emphasized from an AJR article, uh, the radio scaphal capitoid ligament kind of going a little more dorsally, distally there, and then the radial, uh, radial, lunae, radial luno triquetral ligament, uh, a little, go, having a little bit of different orientation going to those bones, again, aka the long radial lunate ligament. 
If you can try to remember two dors two volar extrinsic ligaments, which is the more important extrinsic ligaments, try to remember radioscopic capitoid, radial trochaetral ligament. The dorsal extrinsic ligaments, once again, the dorsal Z. So have you, you have your dorsal um, intercarpal ligament, which starts the scaphoid and ends up on the triquetrum, uh, the, your dorsal radiotriquetral ligament, and your dorsal radioulnar ligament. I know we're repeating ourselves, but that's fine, I think. I mean, this is all stuff you just want to see multiple times until you're so used to seeing it, it's easy for you to see to the extent that it can be seen. MRI image is showing the same thing. So this is that... Um, this is that uh, dorsal, uh, somewhere in here is your dorsal uh, extrinsic ligament showing your dorsal uh, intercarpal ligament, your dorsal radio triquetral ligament, and then down here will be your dorsal radio carpal ligament. Okay, uh, getting towards the end here, so bones, look at the bones and marrow in all planes using coronal as a starting point. I like that just because it's kind of how I think about an x-ray plane to, the, to be the same thing. Uh, and I will go through the bones on all the bones starting wherever, but start the radius and all that, work your way through the carpal bones, work your way to the metacarpals and what you can see of phalanges or whatever. Um, look for edema, fracture, arthritis, reactive edema. If you do find edema, try to find a reason for it. Is there a fracture there? Is this uh, related to arthritis at you know, the first CMC joint? Just make your assessment. A vascular necrosis could also be picked up at this point. And this is also where I like to look for alignment issues. So slack wrist, uh, we, we're not going to talk about too much detail, but that's where you get a disruption of the scaphalunate ligament, proximal migration of the capitate, and uh, arthritis at specific points of the uh, wrist related to that pathology. We talked a little bit before about DISI, uh, dorsiflexion of the lunate on the sagittal, and goes with scaphalunate ligament tear, for example, is where you could talk about this sort of thing or make those findings. Cartilage, we try to look at the best we can. It's uh, This is small, small anatomy, so it can be often hard to look at, but look at your PD fat sats and look at the different joints and, say, and see if you can make an assessment of the cartilage. Uh, cartilage is kind of intermediate to high T2 signal uh, that, that's at the joint spaces. Here's an example on the left of rheumatoid arthritis. We have all these severe erosions. Synovitis, it looks like, with thickening at that distal radial ulnar joint. Joint effusions. Um, and then you'll just notice here, you know, there's no cartilage here. You know, this is just advanced rheumatoid arthritis. Um, yeah, I don't think anything needs to be more said about that. Okay, so here's a cartilage. So, yeah, um, here's just one chance to look for one more normal-ish look at the wrist. So if I'm doing that, I'm looking at all the bones. Is there any bone edema or anything? And then, yes, you can see, you know, here between the lunate and the distal radius, this cartilage in between the two, which looks kind of normal. Cartilage along the distal radial articular surface looks pretty normal. Cartilage between these intercarpal joints looks pretty normal. You know, I'm just kind of looking at the cartilage to make sure everything looks reasonable, um, at least on one sequence through. So, be like, okay, cartilage looks good. Then we move on to soft tissues. Soft tissues is a common, uh, ganglion cysts are a common cause of wrist pain. So we're always looking for masses. I, so I tend to do that at some point, usually towards the end, where I just look for soft tissue masses, especially ganglion cysts. If I see a ganglion cyst, I like to measure it and just describe it. And then if I can say where it's coming from, because typically ganglion cysts will have a communication with the joint space or other source. Um, here's on the top an example of a ganglion in Guillain's canal with ulnar nerve compression. Um, and here's an example of a dorsal ganglion where, yes, sometimes it could be hard to say, oh, yeah, is this in the tendon sheath and it's tenosynovitis or is it a ganglion cyst coming from some joint nearby? You just do the best you can. Okay, and that's actually it. Um, hopefully that's a good starting point to make you comfortable in getting uh, going with wrist MRI in the reading room. Um, please let me know with any feedback or questions. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in there. And once again, at the end here, we have scrollable images. So that'll be, I think, the mo one, hopefully one of the most helpful parts is, you know, you just have an image, you just have a pretty normal study here where you can scroll back and forth at your own pace, try to look at these structures, try to learn what these uh, structures are, uh, fit that into your reading pattern, however you want to do it. And, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, the anatomy is a little bit complex in the risk, but with a little bit of work, it can be gotten down pretty smoothly. And uh, then you'll be able to read these uh, hopefully pretty well. Thanks for uh, listening. Scroll through so there's